to the ship. Ah, okay, this is it. Is this good? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so you see that at this level, um, we are essentially taking a, uh, this equation and turning 90 degrees, um, right? Because uh, you can uh, write psi here, phi here, and just adding a line uh, in between the two. So, uh, so this is at this level we, we are not we haven't done much. Um, maybe one thing to uh, to add uh, how we can uh, interpret this. So you know that every time you have a state, you can uh, uh, represent it in a basis. So you write as a sum over j or some uh, components. And then here I have some basis elements. And uh, remember, an ortho orthogonal basis is one uh, where if you take the scalar product, you get a Kronecker delta. So uh, an orthogonal basis is a set of uh, cats um, that are orthogonal to each other and are complete. So you can write any vector as uh, uh, expanding in this way. So in a way, we can think that a uh, an object with a line up has an index, and an object with a line down also has an index. And when we take the contraction, the, um, when we join the line, we are summing the indices together. So in this case, we will be sum over j star psi j. So a line is an index of an object that can be uh, can have many components. And when we contract two, index, two, two lines, it means we are contracting the two indices. OK, so um, next step, we talk about transformations. So a linear transformation is something that transforms a vector to a vector, for example, if you take the evolution of something, it will be described by a linear transformation. So it's something that take psi to a psi. So how do we describe this in the graphical formalism? It's quite simple. So we start for, from uh, uh, something with a leg up, and then we want to end up with something that again has a leg up. Okay, so the, uh, the transformation A, a <coughs> is described by a box uh, with a, a line in and a line out. Right, so this is, uh, uh, we, if we plug the box onto the state, we obtain another state. So a state is one, something with one leg up, a transformation is one leg down, one leg up. Easy? So again, if you want to think in terms of indices, uh, you take something with an index and you transform by contracting uh, ij, a, uh, sorry, sum over i, j, i, psi, i. So again, you can think that these two legs, each leg represent an index. So this is a matrix because it has two indices. And when you take a transformation, you are contracting, a, a, um, you are contracting one index. Right, and again, uh, you see that uh, uh, still at this level, uh, um, we are not doing a lot. We are just taking this uh, picture and rotating 90 degrees because here we have psi, here we have a. Now, the, uh, the bit where this starts to become uh, useful is when you want to describe composite systems. So composite systems, if you remember, are described by uh, tensor product. So the simplest case is uh, uh, if we have uh, uh, two states, imagine two particles, and each particle has its own state. So for example, could be uh, could have spin, and then you have spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down. And the state of the composite particle is described by a tensor product. And now, uh, in the graphical formalism, a tensor product is very simply described by putting next to each other uh, the two vectors. Right? So, um, this uh, lives in a Hilbert space. This uh, lives in a, another Hilbert space. Now, the combined Hilbert space, the tensor product, is given by two lines up. So now, if I want to write an, an arbitrary state, it will be written as uh, uh, so this is particularly a product state. More general states are not products. And these, uh, uh, so general states will be given by, um, uh, by convex linear combinations of, uh, uh, of states of this type. And these will be just represented as a general object with two lines up. And again, you see that uh, um, if each line is an index, a bipartite state has two indices, which represents the two lines. Um, all right, so uh, this, uh, this starts to become uh, useful because now we have, uh, uh, you see that we have uh, two different directions of our pictures. We have uh, 
The vertical direction is where we apply linear transformation, and the horizontal direction is where we make tensor products. So physically, this, we can give a, a nice physical interpretation. Uh, we can interpret that these uh, uh, boxes and lines represent systems. So each, um, each starting object represents the preparation of a system, and each box represents the transformation of a system, and we put objects next to each other when we have more objects. Um, so for example, if we want to uh, describe uh, um, a linear transformation that uh, uh, acts only on one of, uh, of, uh, of two systems. So we have uh, a system with two um, subsystems, and we want to say, okay, we have one uh, that represents, uh, that uh, acts only on the second one. Then this is uh, simply described by putting the box on the second one. And note that uh, uh, I've been implicit about this, but uh, uh, there is a, uh, the particular uh, transformation, which is identity, which very naturally is described by a straight line, right? Because if you take, if you take a vector and you add a straight line, clearly you, you have the same picture. So identity represents this operation that uh, leaves things the same and is represented by a straight line. Um, right, so this is uh, uh, quite basic. So, so essentially, uh, what we are doing is uh, we are taking the Dirac notation, the bracket notation, turning 90 degrees. And this is, uh, is just uh, a convention. Some people write it le uh, uh, left to right uh, instead of bottom up. This convention aligns with the a tradition of, uh, uh, from relativity where you draw space-time diagrams where time goes from bottom to up. But it's just a convention. Um, and we see that we have these two directions. You can think that this direction is space and this direction is time. And we are composing uh, uh, things in this way. Any question about, about this? This is quite uh, intuitive. Uh, it might seem very simple. Uh, some people uh, like uh, Bob Cook, the author of this uh, uh, paper, claim that once you uh, learn quantum theory in this way with teachers, you can really teach it to children. And, and I will show you there are some, uh, some pictorial rules how to move boxes around. Uh, and you can really prove quite, uh, uh, quite um, advanced results just by moving boxes around. Uh, so also to warn you, there are, uh, uh, people that are quite extremist about this, like the author of that book, that say you should only use pictures to talk about quantum theory. That's a bit, a bit too much. But uh, it really, it, it might seem uh, uh, really simple at the moment, but, uh, um, but you will see that it can be quite powerful. Um, so just to uh, introduce a couple of things, a uh, couple more things. So note that, for example, uh, we can have uh, objects with different number of legs in and out. And again, I think in terms of indices, this will be uh, something with three indices. And one is used to contract uh, cats, and the other is used to contract bras. Uh, an example of this will be if you have a, a transformation A times uh, a state. This will be a box. Uh, and uh, a state. So this means that uh, uh, in this picture we have, uh, uh, we are preparing something here, we don't care what was in the past, while here we are transforming something else. Um, one type of transformation that is, uh, uh, is uh, very important that we have to keep in mind is uh, a unitary transformation, which you all know is the one that satisfy you, you dagger, you dagger, you equal identity. Uh, the pictorial uh, uh, version of this is nothing uh, very surprising. U, U dagger equal uh, U dagger U equal a straight line. So this is a, a, a unitary transformation physically are what describe physical evolution. You heard that the quantum gates are described as, a, as unitary transformation. Uh, this equation means that uh, uh, the, um, the time evolution has an inverse, and so this describes uh, generally reversible dynamics. And later on, we will see how to generalize to non-reversible dynamics. So non-reversible dynamics is when there is some noise or some information gets lost. Um, okay, so I think it's time to uh, then uh, introduce the, the one, uh, so as, as you see, this is uh, pretty much the same as, uh, as quantum circuits. So quantum circuits are written left to right, 
but it's pretty much the same thing. You have a, you start with some state, and then you have boxes that describe transformation. And just I'm I'm a bit more more precise in uh, in the definition. And and keep in mind uh, that eventually what we want to do in quantum theory is to calculate uh, uh, probabilities. So uh, you know that, uh, for example, if we have an expression of this type. So we start with the state psi, we evolve with the unitary, and then we take a contraction with psi. So this will be phi u psi. This is a complex number and represents a transition amplitude to prepare that, that you have for preparing the state psi. And then uh, when you make a measurement to uh, measure an outcome uh, uh, phi. So phi will represents the um, uh, a measurement outcome. And the probability to observe phi given psi is given by the modulus square of the amplitude, phi u psi square. Right, so um, in a certain sense, quantum theory can be seen as a square root of probability theory in the sense the basic objects you have are these complex numbers which are not directly probabilities, but when you take the modulus square, they give you probability. And uh, again, um, uh, uh, train yourself to recognize these diagrams, uh, what objects they are. So something that doesn't have any leg sticking out is a number, is a complex number. Things with legs sticking out can be vectors, transformations, depending how many legs stick out and in which direction. Uh, yes, of course. Yeah. Thank you. OK, so now uh, this formalism, uh, this pictorial uh, formalism starts to become uh, quite interesting once we uh, introduce one uh, extra element. There are really a lot of elements and, uh, and uh, details and, uh, and um, decorations you can add this, uh, this formalism. I will not go in detail. But one that is really quite useful is, uh, uh, is this picture here. So OK, first of all, can anybody tell me what this should represent, like if it should be a vector, a transformation, a state, or a, a bra, a cat, what do you think? Huh? Transformation, why? State, why? Huh? It's all right, I mean, that's, it's the first time you see this, so make your silly guess, it's nobody. That's, that's an excellent uh, uh, intuition. However, remember that uh, in this formalism, I decided uh, arbitrarily that time goes, or, uh, or the direction of transformation goes from bottom up. So a transformation will be something with the leg down and the leg up. Because a transformation has to accept uh, a, a cat, which has a leg down, and then uh, spit out another cat. So this is actually, also you can think of it a transformation, but not from uh, cats to cats, but from uh, uh, bras to cats. Because what we can do is we can stick uh, a, a bra on top of it, and then this will give us a cat. But so, um, but so coming from uh, uh, what I introduced so far, this is a state, because this is something that has uh, two legs up. So remember I was saying that uh, something with two legs up is a bipartite state. Okay, so, uh, so if we have uh, uh, two systems, wow. That's, <laughs> <woo. laughs> Give it a couple of the, seconds and the generator will kick in. The party starts. <laughs> I'll get a bit of my tea in the meantime. Oh, the, the speaker is still on. Yes. Mm. Yeah, because sometimes you have the projected state because they don't know the projected state. Uh -huh. Yeah, also, also this thing is on. So okay, uh, I can keep talking, and you and you make the feature in your mind. Let's see if, uh, if you can do it. Um, yeah. Yeah. So remember that a tensor product in this picture of formalism is represented just by um, um, adding things next to each other. So if one state is uh, one leg up, uh, a state um, two states are uh, two legs up. So this, uh, um, this means uh, the state of two systems. So for example, if you have a, a one qubit uh, state, this will be a two-dimensional uh, 
Hilbert space. You can have two possible. Uh, wow. um, maybe we can make some examples. So, um, a typical example are uh, two-dimensional systems. So qubits. You you heard about that. So you will be uh, zero. Uh, let's write it directly pictorially. Zero represents one zero, and one represents zero one. And now when you have uh, uh, um, the, the tensor product of those, you have four possible basis states. So you will have uh, 0, 0, what represents the vector 1, 0, 0, 0. So is the Kronecker product of, uh, of two copies of this. Then you will have uh, 0, 1 represents 0, 1, 0, 0, and so on. You have four of those, right? So these are these are products. So this is just the same as writing uh, uh, zero zero. But then we can take linear combination of those, and then it's not a product anymore. It's just a general object with two legs up. So the thing is that any object with a number of legs up, it just represents a composite system with more uh, uh, with more uh, subsystems. Yeah. Yeah, so the, uh, the x-axis, you can think of it as space. So you can think that these are uh, uh, one, so, um, so let me stress, the, the, the pictorial formalism really works for any linear algebra. So you don't have to think about uh, system space, you could apply to finance or whatever is your uh, linear algebra application. Uh, but here, um, I will stress the, the physical interpretation. And, uh, um, and so if we think that, uh, uh, and for now, for this lecture, we think that we are describing systems that evolve in time. Uh, then uh, the, the y-axis represents time evolution. So this is time one, time two, time three, and so on. And the x-axis, roughly speaking, represents space, in the sense we have one system here, one system there, one system there. I say roughly speaking because uh, we really can also talk about more uh, degrees of freedom of the same particle. So say if you have a photon, you can describe its polarization. It's horizontal or vertical. It's a qubit. But then you can also describe its shape. Uh, so that's, that's a uh, um, larger dimensional Hilbert space. So you, you can say if, uh, the, the, say, the cross-section of the beam is a circle, is a donut, or something else. And uh, so this is another degree of freedom. So you will represent it in the same way. But in that case, it doesn't really represent space. It represents just more degrees of freedom. But to help intuition, uh, maybe really it's useful to think that, uh, at least as a, as a standard example, that when you add more, uh, more subsystem, you are adding things back to each other. So maybe you have uh, your elements in a quantum computer. Maybe these are ions in an ion trap. So it's an ion here, an ion here, an ion here. Each of these has a leg up. And so you go in space, and there you have the different ions, and in time you go over there. So going back to this picture, so it's a bipartite state. Um, but now, uh, well, it's a particular case. So we, we uh, general states are represented as generic blobs, and now I'm uh, I'm doing this particular thing that is just in line with nothing else. So this is a particular uh, state which is uh, described in this way: sum over j, j, j. Okay. So now you can compare this with the description of identity. Remember, a single line is the identity, something that transforms things as uh, uh, without without changing them. And uh, uh, this in the bracket notation is described as sum over i, j, uh, sorry, sum over i, i, i. So this is the description of identity. And uh, uh, you see it's, uh, you have the same index to the right and the same index to the left, which is exactly what the fact that there is no box in the middle. And now this is exactly the same, except we flipped a bra into a cat. OK? So. Uh, so if, uh, if you want to interpret this as a state, actually it's not normalized. Um, and we can, uh, we can very, uh, sorry? How can you differentiate among the trajectory and the identity? Um, among this, this and this? This one, identity. This? This. 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 So this, this is the same. Uh, this is, I just rewrote the same thing, and I added it, the, um, uh, uh, the representation in this is the identity. Yes. So OK, good point. Um, 
So um, here we are working in a Hilbert spaces of arbitrary dimension. Let's say that the Hilbert space is dimension D. Then identity is the sum from one to uh, D. And um, so you can see that this is the identity because uh, a Exactly. So this is a, a decomposition, right? So this is a particular decomposition of identity into projector, into rank one projector. So if you were summing not up to D, but to some lower number, this will be a projector to a subspace. So, um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, I think this is the, um, yeah, so if I wanted to write a projector, I would write it as something that is a box and not just a line because uh, it's a non-trivial transformation. It, reduced to a, a smaller subspace. Um, right, so we, um, we introduced a special symbol for this, which is, uh, uh, at first must be slightly confusing. So there is, uh, again, identity, but inside, inside this double cap. So for now, take this as a, as a special symbol to represent this bipartite state, okay? Um, so one thing to notice is that this is, uh, uh, is not normalized. So if we take identity times identity, this is called a, a double cat. Uh, this will be sum over i and j. i, i, j, j. Um, and uh, it's often useful to uh, explicitly write labels so that we know what we can, uh, we have to multiply with what. So say that we label the two systems as A and B. So here we write A and B. So this is A, B, A, B. So what we have to do is we have to, uh, when we are multiplying, uh, taking the scalar product of uh, things of non-multiple system, then we have to match the things with the same label. So here we have to match A with A and B with B. And so A with way A with gives us a delta I, J, because this is, um, an orthogonal basis. And this gives us delta i, j, also, when we multiply i with the j. So we can take uh, one sum. Remember that uh, um, the general rule for a Kronecker delta, if, um, if at the moment you don't remember, uh, when we sum delta i, j with uh, any vector j, Essentially what the Kronecker delta does is to replace the index we're summing over with this new index. Which is a, again a, a way to represent the fact that uh, uh, when we combine, uh, um, so you can imagine this is i, i, j. So we are transforming the system that we're uh, summing over into the system j. So here we, we have two Kronecker deltas, so we can use one to substitute the uh, index for the other. So this becomes sum over j of delta j, j. And again, remember, we are summing from one to d. So delta j, j, so re remember Kronecker delta is a zero when the two indices are different and one where the two indices are the same. So this means that this is always one. So this is sum j goes from one to d of one. So this is equal to d. Okay, so this means that th this object we introduce is not a normalized vector, and it has the property uh, if we take uh, the vector and then we multiply with the corresponding uh, bra. Remember, multiplication means we are joining the lines. So the picture will be just a loop, and this loop is equal to the dimension D. So this means that uh, if you want to build a physical state, uh, you will have to build, uh, um, to renormalize it. Uh, and this particular will be, we'll call it the state uh, phi plus is equal one over square root of D of that state over there. So this, uh, uh, this represents a physical state. It represents two particles that are entangled. Entangled doesn't mean that uh, they influence each other. I will talk more about causal influence. It means that uh, if you measure one, you learn something about the other one. So there is correlation. Um, okay, so how can we use, uh, uh, how can we use this? Um, um, well, there are several uses of this and, and some uh, is to, um, 
uh, to get some more structure and some nice simplifications uh, on, um, on, on expressions involving uh, scalar products and uh, quantum systems. So um, maybe I'll go through a couple of examples to show you how, how to use this graphical formalism to simplify some, uh, some expressions. And also to practice a little how to recognize uh, uh, what the pictures represent. So say that I have a transformation A. So remember this is a box, a leg up and a leg down. Now, let me write this picture. Um, how do we interpret it? Can we interpret it? Huh? Uh huh. Yeah. So so we have uh, this bipartite state transformed uh, where one side is transformed with A, and then what happens on the top? So this is closed. So the bipartite state will be if we leave the legs open. Now they're closed. So what happens on the top? So bipartite state means uh, we have uh, A. So this is represented as identity tensor A on this vector we defined. So this is still a state. And now we want to close it on top. So um, how do we do that? So what is uh, this top part represent? Louder? Yeah? Uh, yes. yes. So, so when you have this, a picture of this type, so remember, this represents a number because there are no legs sticking out. And now if we want to write it as a, a product of, uh, say, bras and cats and transformation, you have to think of introducing some, uh, some breaks. So in, in this case, we can introduce a break here. So if we have the object until this point, it's this object. And then this, uh, this cap here represents the bra of uh, the object over there. So this represents identity times Identity A, identity. So why, why is there any interest of this? Let's calculate it. So this is quite simple, sum over i, j. So remember, each of these is uh, twice the same symbol. And then we have uh, identity times A, and then j, j. And then we remember, we have to put, uh, uh, we have to combine things from the same subsystem. So here we have i and j, and here there is identity. So these two go together, i, j. So these and these go through here. So it just represents this line over here. And now we have uh, i and j have this a in the middle. i, a, j. So it represents uh, this part here. And now remember, this is a Kronecker delta. So it means we can use it to, to simplify, to put a equal j. And so what we get, this is just sum over i of i a i, which is nothing but the trace of the operator a. So what we've learned is that uh, uh, this picture represents actually the trace of our, uh, uh, of our operator, of our, of our transformation. And um, this makes sense because remember that uh, these um, we calculated this was equal to D, and it's actually the trace of the identity transformation. So if you, if you single out a line here, this will be trace of identity, and trace of identity is equal to, to the uh, dimension of the Hilbert space. So, so what I want to start to uh, draw attention to is that uh, uh, trace of A is an operation that we do only on one operator, on one Hilbert space. And now this is connected to some operation, to something that happens on two Hilbert spaces. So you see that uh, here we have something that involves uh, one could, uh, uh, could have a physical scenario in which up to normalization, you start with an entangled state, then you evolve one part and, you, and then you project. Uh, and this is something that is a calculation involving two systems. But now we have a rule that allows us to simplify and uh, read it directly. So when, if, you, if we draw the picture, we just looking at the picture, we can recognize that this uh, represents the trace. And so we, we can read it directly as something a calculation done on one system. So this is the first example how this picture formalism can simplify certain calculations. Uh, if you want to have, a, a, again, a, a, an intuition in terms of indices, remember that uh, um, 
uh, a transformation can be thought as a matrix. So we have one index down and one index up. And then uh, remember that joining the legs means uh, making the indexes equal and summing the, uh, them over. So the fact that we are joining this leg here, it means uh, uh, we are maybe making j equal i and summing over, which is exactly uh, the trace operation. Okay? Any, any questions so far? Yes? Uh, this one? So how to go from here to here? Okay, let's, um, let's, draw, let's write some uh, uh, labels on this. Uh, let's call the labels, okay, I've used the symbol A already, so that's not, um, let's just change these into, into U so that I can use it. So I'm just changing the, the name of, uh, of, uh, of this linear transformation such that it's simpler to, to add uh, the labels. So I will write it as U. Uh, U, 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 U. Um, and so now, uh, so to maybe to clarify, we can label the two systems. This is system A and this is system B. And so um, the unitary transformation only acts on system B while A has identity. And so now we have uh, uh, these two, uh, the bra and the bra and the cat, which are bipartite. So uh, this is uh, uh, the bra on A and B. So this is A and B. So remember, this is equal to the sum over J of J, A, J, B. So this is A, B, A, B, A, B. And now when we are uh, to go from this step to this step, we have to uh, multiply separately the things that belong to system A and the system things that belong to system B. So essentially, we simplify this expression by moving this, uh, this A through anything with the label B because this thing only lives on the uh, Hilbert space A. So UB, uh, this moves over here, so it meets identity, identity uh, leaves it unchanged, and then uh, it goes through B because uh, uh, B is in a different space, and so we, we match A with A. And so that's how we go from, uh, uh, from this to having this scalar product IJ. Is it? And similarly, we have uh, uh, the B part has to match together. So J goes to, it leads on, on B, uh, B, B, and so we have uh, I, U, J. So this is what pertains to system A, and this is what pertains to system B. And then, and then the last step here was that, uh, 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 so now we, we obtain something that is just a number and then we finish the calculation by taking the, the scalar product, the Kronecker delta, and then we do the simplification. So maybe, um, yeah, intuitively you can see that you have these uh, systems A and B and uh, um, yeah, you have these, uh, um, well, graphically you can, you can see that uh, uh, so when you have systems A and B, then uh, essentially you can, uh, uh, so a, a system A will, uh, um, uh, will have to be multiplied by things that happen on the system A and B with B. For example, if you have a, an expression of this type, it would be just a, a product of something on A and something on B. So that's, that's what we have uh, had here. We decompose things such that we ended up with the product of things on A and things on B. Um, okay, so what is next? So the first uh, application I want to do of this formalism is to describe teleportation. So I will need a couple of more steps to arrive to teleportation. Teleportation is something that is, uh, is a key ingredient to um, any uh, quantum information, quantum computation uh, uh, technology. And, and typically it takes a, a, few, a few lines, a little bit of work to prove uh, how the quantum teleportation protocol works. But now I will show you that, uh, well, I still need a few lines to introduce some uh, elements of this picture formalism. But once we get it right, the teleportation protocol really is, uh, is a very simple, uh, 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 pictorial uh, um, transformation. It's about just 
uh, playing with the, with the figures. Um, so the things that uh, I need to introduce, uh, um, let's see, first uh, uh, we can introduce the following. So this, is, this was the all uh, math in a way, it's a, it's a nice way to represent math. But now let's, uh, let's talk about some, uh, some physics. So consider a situation where you have uh, three systems. So we, li we label the systems A, B, and C. And now you have the following situation. System A is prepared in some state, in its own state, you don't know what it is. And system B is prepared in some maximally entangled state. And uh, for simplicity, we will use the, the state that we can represent um, in that way. So we start with psi A, Phi plus BC, which picturally just means we have one state here, and then uh, this Phi plus is uh, uh, this element that I introduced time one over square root of T. So remember, this is just a normalization constant. This state was not normalized, and if you want the physical state, it has to be normalized. Uh, and now imagine that uh, uh, I want to measure this with some other, uh, I want to make a measurement where uh, A and B are projected on a maximal entangled state, let's say the same one, A and B, and then uh, um, C is projected on some different state. So now this is, well, huh? Yeah, so we have a physical scenario where we have three particles. And say there are three particles of the same dimension. So let's say there can be three qubits. Okay, so the qubit A is prepared in an arbitrary state. So it's psi, it's uh, any uh, combination of uh, zero and uh, one. And you don't know what is alpha and beta. So it's an arbitrary superposition of, uh, of uh, basic states. while the two particles uh, B and C are prepared in uh, the particular uh, maximal entangled state, phi plus, which is uh, for a qubit, one over square root of two, zero, zero, plus one, one. Okay, you see this is a particular case of the state I wrote uh, over there. So that's just uh, when you have a D-level system it will be zero, zero, plus one, one, plus two, two, and so on. For, a, for two qubits is this system. Um, so we, we have this preparation, and now we are going to do a measurement and consider a particular outcome of a measurement procedure. And the measurement is as follows. The, uh, the systems A and B are measured together, and uh, we consider the situation where the outcome corresponds itself to the state phi plus. Okay, is it clear? So if you have two systems, you can always, maybe this is something I, I didn't stress. Whenever you have a, a description of a quantum state, you can always consider a measurement uh, which essentially corresponds to the question, is the system in this state? So essentially, I can, uh, uh, when I have something like phi plus, I can use it in two ways. As a cat, it means I prepare this system, and as a bra, it means I measure whether uh, the system is in this state. So just to say that uh, when I write it, there is always a measurement procedure. Typically, what you will have to do is take your system, making them interact, and then measure them in some way. And, and then you will have many possible outcomes, and one of the outcomes will correspond to say, yes, I, I saw this state. So essentially what we want to know is the probability that if we start from psi and phi plus, we end up with phi plus and, uh, and phi. So, so the thing is that this expression now is a little, uh, uh, looks a little confusing because remember we, have, uh, we know that uh, uh, we have to multiply things in system A with system A, things in system B and system B, but things are a bit mixed up here. So it's a little, uh, it looks a little complicated. It's not too complicated, we can very easily, uh, and now I will do it, go through the, uh, the math. But uh, let's look uh, at what is the uh, pictorial representation. So between A and B, we have to put the projection, the, the bra corresponding to the maximal limit state. And remember, we have to put the normalization factor. And then on system B, we put uh, the, uh, the bra corresponding to system phi. So this part of the picture represents state preparation. This part of the picture represents measurement. And now we just have to combine together. Okay?
Now this picture is very suggestive that there is this line going through and it's very suggestive that this should be equal, well, one over d first because uh, we had this uh, one of square root of d uh, multiplied, so we put it together, we get one over d. But the picture is very suggestive that this, uh, uh, this line, you can just go through and uh, get phi phi. Okay, so, so I haven't proven it yet, but uh, it's very suggestive that you can do this, and actually you can do it. So I now uh, will, uh, I will do the calculation, it's just a couple of lines, but this is just to say uh, what I think is one of the main uh, um, ways this formalism can help you simplify expression. We have this thing that uh, at first sight is not very clear what happens, but when you throw the picture, it's immediately clear. So essentially it's as if uh, the state travels around and meets directly this other state. So, so let's do the calculation. It's, uh, it's very simple. So we have uh, one over D is just coming from uh, uh, the normalization factor of phi plus and phi plus. And then we have, uh, uh, we have to expand both of those. Remember that's the expression. So we have a sum over two indices, I and J. And then we have I for A, I for B. This is phi plus on AB. Then we have our system phi on C. Then we have uh, J on, uh, uh, sorry, then we have uh, psi on A. And then we have J on B and J on C. So we have, uh, um, so this part is the bra and this part is the cat. And now, as always, we have to, uh, to take each of these bras and cats and multiply each cat by the bra with the same label. So A goes with A. So we have one over D, sum over I, J, I, here we, we meet with Psi. And then we have uh, B goes with B, so we have uh, I with J. And then we have Phi meets with J we have phi and j. And so now uh, you see that this i and j gives uh, uh, our usual uh, Kronecker delta, which allows us to put, to get rid of one of the two summations and put i equal j. So this is one over d, sum over j, i psi, phi, uh, sorry, j psi, phi j. But now you see that this is really just a scalar product between phi and j. So I'll maybe finish the calculation over here because otherwise it might not be visible. So this is equal to sum over uh, uh, j of uh, phi j j psi. Which is actually equal to Phi psi. So we have proven that uh, uh, we have proven the, uh, what picturally was very intuitive, and uh, and the reason was intuitive was exactly the reason why I introduced this particular symbol, uh, uh, these two particular symbol of these lines, because they're exactly those that allow us to transport uh, states from one side to another. So this is a, a calculation that, uh, if you are interested in this field, I allow you, I I encourage you to. Uh, to repeat at least once by yourself to convince uh, uh, to convince yourself that this uh, uh, this formalism makes sense. But the point is that once you have done it and have, you have proven it, then you know that uh, essentially uh, this translates in the following graphical rule: that if you have a, a, a bent line in your picture, you can uh, uh, transform it into a straight line. So this is called the Yanking rule. It means that basically you can take your line and, and straighten it up. Okay. Haha. <laughs> so, so one over d is a factor of, in front of everything, right? So one over d was because. Uh, um, oh, yeah. Sorry. Here, here there was one over d. Yes. Uh -huh. One over d. Yeah. In particular, this tells you that the probability in this case will be the scalar product. Uh, the probability to prepare psi and then measure uh, phi times a one over d squared. We will have to take the modulus squared. 
Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, but, uh, but just as the graphical rule is, uh, is concerned, the, the one over D was a factor in front of all the pictures. So the graphical rule just tells you that uh, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, straighten these lines. So remember, what we had in the picture was uh, a 1 over d in front of everything. So this means that the 1 over d simplifies, and you can always, uh, so you can uh, summarize this whole calculation as this simple pictorial rule. Actually, how much time do we have left? Um, it's 5.20, okay, we have, um, Half an, Half an hour. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Okay. So this is the uh, this is the moment to uh, to take stock. So we introduced this uh, formalism, which is basically just a two-dimensional uh, uh, Dirac uh, notation. So you have bras and cats, and the only difference is that uh, with the just writing bras and cats is that you have these two directions. So when you have the usual uh, um, Dirac notation, you will uh, write on this on uh, in in one line expression like psi phi and then uh, a tensor identity. It's all going in one line, which makes things uh, sometimes hard to read. Uh, now we we we, dec we we separated the two directions as uh, one direction for tensor product, one direction for uh, linear transformation, which physically you can think one direction is space and one direction is time. And now we introduce this uh, this one little trick, which is this uh, this one uh, uh, this one uh, um, graphical uh, element, uh, which which allows us to make these uh, these very nice simplifications. And, uh, and I think this is quite powerful because, uh, again, if you had this, uh, I mean, uh, you saw that this, this calculation was not very long, but, uh, but you also see that this is much shorter. If you, if you see this, you see immediately, okay, I straighten it up and it becomes the scalar product. Okay, so this really uh, allows you, uh, in many cases, when you have some complicated expression involving tensor products and linear transformations, you can simplify them into something much, uh, much more compact. Any question about the uh, thing so far? Yes. So one over root two is uh, represents the normalization. So this was one over root d, but uh, uh, this represents the normalization, which physically means uh, that we are considering a state that is prepared with probability one. So uh, in particular, remember I said that uh, uh, for every state uh, that represented by a cat. You can represent, you can consider a corresponding bra, which physically is the question, is the system in this state? And so you want that for consistency, if you prepare a state and you ask, is the system in this state? The answer should be yes with probability one, which means that mathematically you want that uh, each state is normalized, psi psi equal one. All right, so, and that's why we took this uh, uh, one over square root of two, because uh, this object by itself was not normalized. The, the, um, Scalar product was giving a D, and if we multiply by one over D, we get a normalized state. Um, yep. Okay, so teleportation. You need the. Okay, maybe I will I will uh, tell you something without proving because it's not very long to prove, but uh, but it's just uh, useful to know. Um, so first of all, we can introduce this other symbol A as uh, uh, identity times A on I to just represent uh, applying uh, a transformation to one side of our, uh, um, our special vector, which also uh, tells you why I describe this as a, as a identity. So uh, the pictorial way you can interpret this is that uh, you have uh, a transformation A with a one leg down, one leg up. You can always map it to something with two legs up by bending a line. And physically, this means I apply the state, the transformation to one part of the maximally entangled state. So if you part, apply a transformation to one side of an entangled state, then you get an entangled state. So that's how you can map a transformation to a state. So this is just, uh, uh, just notation. And now something I will prove without, uh, I will show without uh, proving is that uh, if we take a box across the line, we get a, a transposition. So this is quite simple, but just for, uh, for sake of time, I will uh, only state it. Um, 
So if we take a state and then apply to the left, is the same thing as applying the transform. Sorry, if we take a transformation and, and apply to the left, is the same as applying the transpose of that to the right. So remember, transpose is just if this is a matrix with rows and columns, we swap rows and columns. Uh, and uh, this means, so essentially, this means that if you slide the box along a line, uh, this corresponds to taking a transpose. And of course, this also means that if you take a box and you slide it along two, two curves, uh, it goes back to be the same, which you can get directly because uh, in both cases, you can straighten these two lines to be just one line. So every time you can take it along a kink, you get a transpose when you flip it upside down, and then it goes back head up when you go this, uh, this way. So I, I just give you the rule. If you want to prove it, it's really not, uh, uh, not complicated. OK, so now uh, um, we want to talk about teleportation. So te teleportation is essentially uh, using this, uh, uh, this little trick that I've shown you. So here, uh, physically, we had uh, this state preparation. And uh, that was one state and one maximally entangled state. And then I've shown that uh, uh, if we make this joint measurement, then we have some probability if, if we see the, the particular outcome, then essentially uh, our state is reprepared over here. So we can, uh, um, we can rewrite uh, uh, this without this psi as just so the, uh, the intuitive rule is that uh, if we have a state, um, if we succeed to, uh, to measure this uh, particular entangled state, then on the remote side, we have actually prepared this initial state. Whoa. So, uh, so the problem is that this happens only with the probability 1 over d, because sometimes we will see this measurement, sometimes we will not. And uh, the idea of teleportation is uh, to use this fact, but to try to make it so that uh, we end up always with the original state on the other side, uh, regardless of what is the measurement outcome. So, so to do this, we have to introduce uh, the other measurement outcome. So remember, this phi plus was uh, uh, one possible measurement outcome. So now we have to introduce a protocol where uh, uh, we are performing a measurement here, and we consider all possible uh, uh, measurement outcomes. So in particular, we consider uh, a basis of entangled state. And the basis is, uh, um, well, I could write the basis, but uh, uh, maybe I will uh, more simply write this thing, sigma mu. So mu is uh, an index that is 0, 1, 2, 3. So remember, now we have, we have, uh, we have uh, two. Uh, so we are considering the particular cases of uh, two qubits. So the Hilbert space of two qubits has dimension so one qubit has dimension two. Okay, two qubits have dimension four. Okay, so if we want to make a measurement on a two qubit state, we need four basis elements. And um, well, okay, now I will need uh, the light. Um, see what I can tell you. Ah, there we go. So. We can consider the, uh, uh, the four states that are constructed in this way. Sigma 0, uh, so we have sigma 0, sigma 1, sigma 2, and sigma 3 are the following matrices. So sigma 0 is identity. Sigma 1 is uh, just sigma x. So 0, 1, 1, 0. And uh, um, sigma 2 is, uh, is just sigma i. And sigma 3 is just sigma z. And now it's, uh, um, and then rewrite it down here. We define the state, the basis state mu, as 1 over root 2 uh, sigma mu. So this means, uh, again, I will not prove it, but uh, you can show that uh, um, you can uh, generate the four uh, uh, basis states. So these are four maximal entangled state that are uh, obtained by starting from uh, our uh, um, phi plus state is one uh, a maximal entangled state, and then applying uh, um, a poly operation on one side. 
So if you, if you do this, you get four different states and you can show that they are orthogonal and they form a basis. Okay, so this is an interesting trick because uh, you have uh, uh, these four uh, states and they're all generated by applying uh, uh, an operation to only one side. Okay, so now we consider the following protocol. We start, and now I will uh, start to use just the pictures and, uh, and start to skip over the, the math because uh, now we have seen that the pictures uh, can be directly translated to the math. So we start with uh, some state, uh, which we don't know what it is. Um, and uh, the objective, uh, so we have these three systems, A, B, C. The, the objective is to teleport the state from system A to system C. How do we do it? So we, we have the system on system, the system prepared on A, and now we entangle B and C. And we entangle it as we were doing before with the maximally entangled state. Uh, and we're thinking that uh, uh, the system C can be something really far away on the other side of the galaxy, while the system B is something that we have in the laboratory next to system A. So now we measure system A and system B with the joint measurement. And this measurement will have four possible outcomes that correspond to these four possible uh, maximally entangled states. And now I've shown you that these four, these four states can be all uh, represented by uh, applying a, um, a polymetrics on one side. So if we want to know, um, say, the probability, uh, or say that this is the amplitude to, um, to observe one of the four. Uh, so for, uh, for each of the particular measurement outcomes, this will be our diagram. And again, notice that there will be a one over two. So maybe I will, uh, just for simplicity, stick it on one side. So for, uh, uh, for each outcome, this state will be transformed to some state. And remember, we have this uh, uh, transposition rule. So uh, this is transposes to um, 1 over 2. Um, yes. Sorry. Um, Yeah, uh, sorry, psi and uh, sigma mu transpose. So you see that we haven't quite uh, teleported our state because uh, uh, depending on which outcome we get, uh, we get a transformation of the state. However, now if we, if we can make a phone call from uh, this laboratory to this laboratory, we can tell, hey, I observed, uh, say, outcome three. Please, uh, whatever uh, state you have there, transform it with the transpose of, uh, of, uh, uh, of this polymetrics. And this transpose, it's, it's, uh, it's not an important thing. So it's just uh, the same three things, just this with the minus sign, which is just a relative phase, it's not really important. So the point is that now the protocol is the following. I have my two system in one lab, and I, uh, I make a joint measurement, and then I, I, I make a phone call and I tell, uh, the other lab, which one, uh, uh, which result I got. And then on that lab, uh, someone will perform uh, uh, this extra transformation. Um, and once you do it, you see that you get, uh, because uh, the square of a, of a poly matrix is always identity, uh, they are, uh, um, self-adjoint and unitary. You will just get the state. Now, there is still a factor here, which means that uh, different outcomes will happen with different probabilities. But now the point for, uh, is that for each of these outcomes, what happens at the end is that I have prepared the, uh, um, the original state. So this means that overall, in the protocol with probability one, uh, we can uh, uh, re-prepare our state in the remote location. So this is teleportation. How many saw teleportation before? Did it look more complicated than this? No, okay, sorry. I hope this will be a simplification. So for those that didn't see, I hope this is a, a, um, a, this is a nice pictorial way to see it because essentially what you have is a, a, you just have to, uh, to represent your physical procedure a, as a diagram. 
So the physical procedure is uh, I start with this state preparation and then I make this measurement and this correcting operation. And then just by doing these, uh, these rules, by sliding the box and straightening the line, you can directly show without going through any extra calculation that what you end up with is the original state that you wanted to teleport. Okay, so this is a, a, a way to show how this, uh, this pictorial formalism can be used. Um, right. Any question about this? Huh? Oh, thank you. Well, I, I didn't invent it. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is a nice trick that, uh, that can simplify your life if, uh, if you want to, to work with quantum mechanics. My advice to use this formalism is not trying to make all calculations with the, with the pictorial things. Just draw the diagram and then use it to simplify things and to guide you in what type of calculation you have to do. Because then uh, it shows you, uh, basically, the, the, the graphical rules will tell you what, what result you should expect. And then you can check and, uh, and go through the calculation, but it will be much simpler if you have the, um, uh, the guide of, of the graphical formalism. So yeah, I gave the reference at the beginning. Um, unfortunately, it's not, well, yeah, it depends how much in depth you want to go. So there is uh, uh, this paper. So this is an, an archive number, 09, uh, where is it? 0908.1787. So the thing is that you can, uh, um, you can push it a bit farther and, and formulate this whole thing in the language of category theory, because basically it's, uh, it's talking about the structure of how you can define objects and uh, morphisms between objects. And so you can, you can become quite abstract about it, which I didn't want to do. Um, so uh, I think this paper here has a bit of balance of connecting with ordinary quantum systems, quantum description and graphical rules. But then, yeah, so you will have to, uh, to find your way through to a lot of category theory language. But I think this is quite good uh, reference. So this is Bob Koeke. Uh, if you look up this paper, uh, you can also find a book by the same author that goes much more, uh, much more in depth on the same subject. Huh? Yeah. So this is just a, a, a review from a few years ago, but uh, there, is, there is a book, book published uh, just two years ago, I think. Um, and yeah, the book is quite big, and, uh, and talks about many, many other aspects and many other things uh, that you can do, like talk about theories that are not quantum theory, but generalizations, or, uh, or uh, they introduce many more uh, um, symbols because the, the approach there is that you want to do absolutely everything, only drawing pictures and never have to write a, a cat or a bra, which I think is a bit too much, but, but it's an interesting approach for sure. Okay, now very briefly, we have uh, some uh, 20 minutes. Um, uh, I want to start, start talking about mixed states. So, um, so I hope that, uh, uh, that all of you will take something out of this. Um, now we'll start to talk, get into uh, slightly more advanced topics. Um, and later in the lectures, there will be a bit more of concepts, like uh, later uh, in the afternoon and, uh, uh, and uh, tomorrow. But, um, but yeah, I hope that uh, there will be enough that uh, people coming from different backgrounds can uh, can take home something. So I, th I think the graphical formalism itself is, uh, is quite useful. So, okay, now talking about mixed state. So you heard about mixed state before in, uh, in the last few days. So a mixed state, uh, in general, it represents a system of which we don't have a, a complete knowledge. So uh, here we are talking just about pure states. It means represent a situation where we have complete knowledge of what is our system. And now there are two situations in which we can have partial knowledge. One is, uh, uh, if we have a system in the lab and we don't know in which pure state it is. So if we have a, a system that could be in say state psi one or say psi two, but we don't know and this has probability pi one, P1 and P2, then this is represented by the density matrix P1 psi one plus P2 psi two where these are, are the projectors. 
The other situation in which we can get a mixed state is if we have, a, uh, say, a bipartite system, but we don't have access to, uh, to one side. Uh, in that case, uh, our uh, uh, density matrix row A is given by the partial trace of the projector on the joint system. Uh, psi, psi, A, B. Okay, so, so uh, now here we're talking about uh, state transformation measurements and so on for pure state. One can go through all the same thing with the uh, mixed states. Uh, the important thing to keep in mind is that the structure is very similar and the similarity is given that by the fact that for pure state, we are talking about a Hilbert space, so you can sum things together. Physically, the sum corresponds to um, a superposition. So if you can have something that is, can be up or down, it can be a superposition of up and down. And superposition means that if you measure, you will see up or down with some probability, but you can also do a reversible transformation that say takes you to zero or one. Now for density metrics, you also have a, a um, structure of, uh, uh, of linear space. So you can also sum uh, density matrices, uh, just uh, um, and you can multiply by scalar. So it's just that now the sum of two density matrices, so if you have something like row one, P1, P1, row one, and P2, row two, this doesn't represent a superposition, but represents a probabilistic mixture. So this means, well, which is uh, already clear from this expression over there, but this means I have in my lab, uh, I don't know if I have density matrix row one or row two. I know that I have uh, row one with probability P1 and row two with probability P2. And then I can describe my system with uh, uh, a new density matrix, which is just the convex combination of the two. So uh, just to say that, uh, we also have a linear structure here. We have a, a, a vector space where we can sum things. And, um, and it just has uh, this uh, different uh, interpretation that uh, it represents probabilities rather than uh, uh, complex amplitudes. So the fact that we have this, uh, uh, um, uh, this linear structure, it means that actually we can uh, use the same formalism instead of talking about pure state, about talking about uh, uh, density matrices. Uh, so in particular, if we take the pure state formalism, a density matrix is an operator, something that acts on a Hilbert space. So uh, remember, if we have a projector, something of this type, this will be represented by taking a, a bra and the cat. And then a general density matrix would be something with one leg up and one leg down. Uh, sorry, this is wrong. Now, if uh, uh, um, now we, we could just keep this uh, uh, this formalism all the way through. It's just that we will soon end up with a lot of legs around, and so it's useful to simplify and rewrite in the case where we are really just using a, a mixed states uh, to re to rewrite as one leg. So this might be slightly confusing at first, but just say that when you see a picture, you have to know if uh, if it represents pure states or mixed states. The physical interpretation is really the same. We have a uh, uh, legs going up represent time evolution. It's just that now we are describing mixed state instead of pure state. Okay, so now we, we can, uh, uh, I will very, very briefly go through the same story, but for mixed state, and, and briefly because uh, uh, I think you get the picture, uh, literally. It's, it's just a, a graphical formalism. So states can be transformed. You can take a state and make a linear transformation. And of course, a linear transformation is represented by a box. So this is something that takes your state row and maps it to something E row. In particular, if you, for example, are evolving your state as a unitary with a unitary transformation, this will be uh, U row U dagger. It's just a particular case, and then you have more general ways to transform your, uh, uh, your density operators. Um, the density operators have the properties that they, they must be positive semi-definite and must have trace equal one. So now uh, for the trace, I will uh, introduce a special symbol, which is, uh, uh, this is starting to get faint. Yes.
So this uh, uh, ground uh, ground simple just means that I'm taking the trace of uh, of the system, and uh, density operators have the uh, uh, the properties that uh, um, their trace is equal to one. So um, I hope we'll be fine. That I will go a bit quickly, but. Uh, now we are talking about preparation and measurements for pure state. Now we can talk about preparation and measurement for a, a mixed state. I will simply uh, tell you uh, um, the, the rules. So now uh, measurements uh, for mixed states are represented by uh, also positive operators, which sum to identity. So this is a collection of operators. J is an index that tells you what is your measurement outcome. And if you want to have, know the probability to observe outcome J, given that you prepare state row, this is given by the formula, take the trace of EJ with row. So picturally, this is just, again, you take row, and then you combine with J. So essentially, uh, the, the, way that the only way you have to remember the rule changes from uh, um, uh, from pure to mixed state is now combining the line means taking a joint trace, joint trace instead of taking uh, the sum over joint indices. But physically, it represents the same thing. A prepared state, a measure, and uh, uh, this diagram represents the probability. All right? Yes? Uh, this one? So, okay, maybe I can go slightly slower. So consider the particular case where rho is... Uh, a pure state, and the particular case where E are projective measurement. So say that this phi j are a set that is a decomposition of identity, so sum over j phi j is equal to 1. So uh, if you want to know the, um, the probability coming from the formalism we had before, we know that the probability to observe phi j given psi is given by the modulo square of the scalar product phi j psi mod square. Now, this mod square can be written as phi j psi times psi phi j, because the scalar product is the number then times its complex conjugate, and the compl complex conjugate of a scalar product is just the uh, scalar product when you swap the two terms. Okay, so this, you can also write it as the trace of uh, phi j times psi. So this means that uh, an alternative way to write the probability is to write it as a trace of a, a preparation operator, which here is a projector, times a measurement operator, which here is uh, also a projector. But now we can generalize if we have a, uh, uh, going back there, something that is a mixture is this, you have a preparation of some probability this and some probability this. Then you see that uh, uh, down here, the, pro the final probability will be P1 times this expression for Psi1 plus P2 times this expression for Psi2, which we can take inside this expression, which will give us trace of, uh, let me write again, EJ, where now EJ I'm just meaning uh, this projector. P1 psi 1 plus P2 psi 2, which is just uh, uh, the expression that I wrote over there, trace of Ej times rho. And again, uh, the picture representation is simply that. If you want a bit more of the, the mathematical structure, this still represents a scalar product. Um, so, rep so in the previous case, we were seeing that uh, multiplication of Brian Kett is, can be interpreted as a scalar product in Hilbert space. And here too is just that the scalar product is the Hilbert Schmidt scalar product that is defined in general as AB Hilbert Schmidt is the trace of uh, A dagger B. So one can show that this is a, a scalar product. And the reason uh, we don't have dagger here is it, because uh, these are self adjoint operators, so A dagger is equal B. So that's just to say that. Uh, this is, in fact, the same picture of formalism. It just now refers to this uh, different Hilbert space with this color product. Um, if you want a bit more of the mathematical background. If you don't know what is a Hilbert Schmidt color product, don't worry. Just, just know that this is now the new rule for uh, this higher order. 
I introduced the two things because uh, sometimes it's really convenient to work with pure state and sometimes it's really convenient to work with mixed state. And so depending on the situation, you might want to, to use the two things. Um, any other question? Yes? Yeah, so in the way I've drawn things, you don't. It would be nice if I was skilled enough to, I don't know, draw this as a, as a little different line to, to stress that it's something else. So uh, you just have to know in, in this context. Yeah, if somehow you don't, at some point of the lecture, you don't know if what I'm drawing is a mixed state or a pure state, just ask. So typically, we'll, when writing a picture, we'll tell, uh, uh, I mean, uh, say from now on, we are using mixed state, or from now on, we are using pure state. You just have to, to know. So, yeah. Well, yeah, it would be nice, but I'm really not skilled enough to, to draw things. So I will, I will rather make the, use the same pictures and then from, uh, from context, you tell if it's, if it's mixed or pure. Also, um, keep in mind that the physical interpretation is, is really the same. It's just that uh, uh, in the sense that uh, we can still interpret these diagrams as representing space and time. It's just that in some cases it's mixed state, in some cases it's pure state. So often, if we want to describe some general situation, in fact, we can draw a picture and not really say if it's pure or mixed because the, the physical representation is the same. It's just that one, once then you want to go and make a particular calculation, we will have to specify. Um, okay, so we have uh, 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 just five minutes left, so I will uh, uh, quickly complete the picture. Um, so again, we have a few uh, special elements. One is identity map, is still represented in this way, and this is still identity. Identity applied to row is just row, so that's quite intuitive, the same as we were doing before. Uh, again, uh, keep in mind now we have uh, things with leg, leg up are operators that represent state preparation, things with leg down are uh, operators that represent measurement. When we combine them, we take the trace and they represent the probability. Um, We can also uh, introduce this object here. It has the same meaning as before. It's just now it's the projector on, uh, on the state that we, that we were defined before. Okay, so we, we define that as a bipartite pure state. And now this corresponds to a bipartite operator, which is just a projector over there. And it has exactly the same properties that uh, um, especially this, uh, this graphical uh, um, Equation is still right. So uh, things that we were saying before uh, at the picture level still uh, work in the same way. And actually, uh, to make this simpler, I will just make you aware that I might at some point use this compact notation because this is, well, this is not entirely necessary, but uh, uh, it really helps that uh, in this case, I have to write things once and not twice, and they're a bit more compact. That's nothing deep in there, but my own way of simplifying the, the notation. Um, you know, among, uh, um, so we have states and measurements and uh, transformations. So transformations are again uh, boxes, as we said before. And as a particular type of box, uh, we want to talk about those that can, can happen with probability one. So this is just, you take a state and it just gets transformed and you are certain that can happen. So these are uh, um, called the completely positive and trace preserving maps. So you remember that rho is positive. So when you transform it, you want that this is also positive because it has to be, again, a density matrix. Completely positive is a slightly technical, uh, um, it's a slightly technical uh, um, statement, but it just means that uh, if you apply your uh, transformation to an entangled state, also it's positive. So essentially you can also tensor it with identity and it remains a positive uh, uh, transformation. Not, uh, uh, not extremely important for our purposes. What is important is that uh, if you want your uh, uh, transformation to happen with probability one, it has to preserve the trace. So it means that the trace of uh, epsilon rho is equal to the trace of rho. And the reason is that the, uh, um, the trace of a, of a density matrix represents the probability with which it can happen, in particular, uh, a, just a state preparation is represented by density matrix with probability one, uh, with trace one, and that's because uh, when we sum up, uh, so remember, um, maybe I will write this over here. 
the probability to observe some outcome is equal to the trace of ej rho. The sum over all outcomes is equal to trace sum over j ej rho. Now, the definition of a, a set of measurement operator is that the sum over all outcome, I put it identity. So this gives trace of identity rho, which is trace of rho. And now, if, if these are all possible outcomes that can happen, these have to be equal ones, because probabilities have to be normalized. So the short uh, uh, thing you have to remember that uh, probability normalized means trace of rho equal one. So this means that uh, if we have a, a transformation that preserves probability, which is all physical transformation that happens with probability one, it has to preserve the trace. And the simple graphical notation of this is, uh, well, okay, we can write it twice. So if we take our state, apply transformation, then the trace is the same as taking the trace of uh, our transformation. Or uh, you can write it directly as an equation for uh, your map in this way. So this is the condition that says this is a transformation that can happen with probability one. Um, and then we have one minute left to talk about instruments, which is really the last uh, uh, point of this, uh, of this first lecture, um, which will uh, we'll, uh, then bring us to, to the topic of next lecture. So uh, here, when we describe uh, uh, measurement operators in this way, we are just saying we have a system, and we measure, and we just want to know the probability. But now, often, physically, you have a system, you measure it, and then you still have a system later on that you can also measure again. So often, we also want to know, to be able to describe, uh, given a system, what do we have afterwards, after we measure it. So this is described by more general maps, which are completely positive, but not trace-preserving, so without this... Uh, uh, this property. And uh, a general measuring procedure will be uh, described by a collection of uh, completely positive maps. So this J again represents the measurement outcome. Uh, so this means we have our system and then we have make a measurement and uh, the outcome can be J equal one, two, three, and so on. And uh, uh, after we measure it, the system uh, rho is transformed to MJ rho. And the, uh, the condition for, uh, uh, for this to be a complete measurement is that if we sum over, uh, okay, and, uh, and in particular the probability, the probability to obtain an outcome J is just given by the trace of MJ rho. So now if we sum over all uh, probabilities, Uh, we want to get one because the uh, sum of all probabilities is one. So this trace of sum over j m j rho, it has to be equal to trace of rho. So this means that uh, an instrument is defined by a collection of maps. Uh, so I will write it down here again. M j, they are completely positive. C p is shorthand to say completely positive, and such that uh, the sum over all outcomes is. Uh, Trace preserving. Okay, so picturally is uh, um, well, well, it's the same equation here as here. It's just that now this epsilon is the sum of all j. Okay, so it's an instrument is a, a collection of of maps uh, that uh, sum up to a trace preserving map, and uh, and physically this is the most general way you can describe a transformation of a quantum system given that you have done a measurement on it. So typically people talk about the update or collapse. Uh, we'll not go into the metaphysics of that. It's just, for our purpose, it's just a rule. If you take your system, you measure it. Uh, so for, for example, if you take a system that is a superposition of uh, spin up and spin down, you make a measurement, you see it as say a spin up. This is transformed to the system spin up. So that will be a particular map defined as uh, So a particular case of a trace preserving map is, uh, sorry, a particular case of a measurement map is something that takes your row and then you take the uh, expectation value with respect to some state and then you reprepare uh, the state. So if you have two of those, this means you are making a projective measurement 
uh, on the computational basis, and you prepare a state zero if you measure zero, and state one if you if you measure one. And uh, you can see if you take the sum of these two, well, let's just do it in one second, sum over uh, uh, j equals zero, one, and j rho, you will get, uh, um, and then you take the trace, you see that the trace of zero is always equal to, to one, the trace of this is always equal to one, so this is zero, rho zero, plus one, rho one, which is just the trace of rho. Okay, so I think uh, uh, this is all uh, uh, for the moment. I will uh, maybe briefly recap this last bit in the afternoon, and then we will move on to, uh, to, more, uh, to more general situations. Thank you.